Welcome, everybody. Welcome just a minute early to our webinar on the methane features of En-ROADS. My name is Andrew Jones. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Climate Interactive. And I'm here with uh, Ava DeLeon and Clara Iglesias and Ellie Johnston and other members of Climate Interactive. So excited to share our new methane features with you. We'd like to hear where you are in the world or see where you are on this map that I hope you can see. We're gonna use polling software, Poll Everywhere. There's a link you can see at the top of the screen. There's also a QR code you can use. And Ava, would you post the link into chat? So open up chat, click on that link, open another browser window, and then put your dot on the map of where you are in the world today. We've got somebody in Europe and Canada and New England. Fantastic, you're figuring it out. Love it. So helpful to see where people are in the world. Brazil, United Kingdom, West Coast US, somewhere north of Alaska, South America, Scandinavia, welcome. If you're just joining, open up another browser window, open up poll everywhere you should see in chat the link. We'd love to see where you are in the world. Please click on those links. See people are writing in chat as well, where they're coming from, great to see it. If you're just joining, this is the webinar about methane in En-ROADS. My name is Andrew Jones, Executive Director, Co-Founder of Climate Interactive, here with Ava DeLeon and Clara Iglesias and Ellie Johnston. We're thrilled you're here. We're gonna be diving into a big update of methane in En-ROADS, but also nitrous oxide and F gases and some changes to carbon dioxide removal. We finally, made some changes to the front screen of En-ROADS and we'd love to show you what we've done. And also some of the possibilities and uh, big possibilities for addressing methane and therefore reducing future temperature. I'm gonna move to our second uh, question here in chat. This is great to see where you are, but we're also curious your previous experience with En-ROADS. If you're just joining, go to Poll Everywhere, see this poll and answer this question. How have you experienced En-ROADS in the past? Maybe you've never even seen it or heard of it. Maybe you saw a presentation of it, a workshop, you saw a video. C would be, oh, I saw it. I actually opened it up. I clicked around and I tried some things. A next level is, Oh, I clicked around and I actually learned how to show it to somebody else in a game or a workshop. And the last one is that you are an En-ROADS climate ambassador. And those are the people who have gone through our full 63 short video course with a lot of 30 quizzes. Actually, Ava, would you post that Mastering En-ROADS course? It is a fantastic way to learn how to engage other people in taking ambitious climate action. So we're curious who you are and what are we seeing? We're seeing that half of you are ambassadors. Cool. Half of you are serious users of En-ROADS out in the world in with government, policy, community work, education. We're thrilled you're here. Half of you are that. And all the way at the other end of the spectrum, 6% haven't seen the simulator before are brand new to it. Well, you're gonna see, I'm gonna to have to cover a span of some experienced users all the way back to very first folks ever using this thing. So helpful to see uh, your level of experience. Okay. I'm gonna make this nice and big and all right. Welcome everybody. My name is Andrew Jones, Executive Director of Climate Interactive, and I'm here with more on the CI team. And we're thrilled to, to welcome you to this experience of the improvements we've made to En-ROADS. 
and also some of the other areas. We work closely with the MIT Climate Pathways Project. They build the model with us and they share it out in the world. We are a nonprofit, publicly supported climate tech organization. There are 14 of us, and we are thrilled at the flood of climate solutions and proposals that are coming to businesses and legislators around the world. And we're really vexed by the fact that top decision makers don't have a way to evaluate what is really effective climate policy and what is not effective, distracting or pushing us in the wrong direction. So we are supporting people around the world and we go to top decision makers, but these are the people around the world Many of them are on this call who are taking these tools to top decision makers to help them understand the urgency of this crisis and what is going to help and what isn't going to help. The theme of today is what it's going to help is addressing methane in many big ways. And we're thrilled to have someone from the uh, global methane hub, Nicolas Diaz, who is from the organization that funded some of this model improvement work. And I want to note, without philanthropy, without individual donors like you all, we don't exist. That's how we pay for things. We also sell some services as well. But uh, if you want to help the climate, give money to Climate Interactive. Ava, would you send the donate page? Or if you know somebody in philanthropy who cares about getting top tools to top decision makers, please write to support at climateinteractive.org. And can you put, Ava, can you put that link in chat as well? So, Nicholas, I'm so thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining us. And let's switch over to, uh, to you. And Nicholas, yeah, hey, there you are. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, Drew. Uh, I'm trying to initiate my camera. I'm having some difficulties, uh, like <laughs> during the other morning. But uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation. We're super excited of like seeing this develop. Um, as you said, I'm Nicolas Diaz. I'm the senior um, waste and circular economy manager. Um, and at the Global Methane Hub, uh, we are the world's leading philanthropy, and we focus our work on obviously reducing methane emissions. Um, this is a big topic, as you are well aware. Um, given the like extreme growth of uh, like rate, rate um, growth rate that that uh, these emissions um, contribute to like global warming. Um, so it's a, a very short term agenda for long lasting um, challenges in the waste, um, agriculture and energy sectors. And we believe that addressing these emissions will protect the people and the planet from the worst effects of climate change. But also it's a great opportunity to advance on this um, like so uh, delayed um, like challenges as, as we can talk about like uh, emissions in the oil and gas sector, um, uh, how, how we ensure the livelihoods of small farmers across the developing countries and also how we ensure we get to a circular economy uh, by reducing emissions, of course. Um, and we are super excited on on seeing this uh, initiative, this effort, um, like uh, continue and grow. Um, the the methane uh, visualization was uh, key for 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 awareness, as you are well aware. Um, and also, obviously. What we try to aim to is, is to get all the stakeholders, leaders, uh, local organizations, uh, uh, all actors to see the same data, to align on, on what can be done and drive all that data into action. Uh, yeah, we are committed to absolutely. this. We, we work with this. And obviously, Android is, is a great opportunity for doing so across like the constellation of platforms that we, we are supporting. So yeah, very, very excited to see this develop and 
uh, back to you to see what advancements we saw and, and what's the potential for, for all of this. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you so much. And thank you to Global Methane Hub. Um, and like you just said, all players, all stakeholders to see the data and align on what needs to be done. And I'm going to uh, open another poll for you because I'm curious uh, of your answer to this question. And open the, another poll site and think about this because we modeled over this last year have modeled methane and we've been struck by, we know what to do. The solutions are abundant and specific. We know what to do. So everybody, you do, do as well. Remind us, please, when you think about addressing emissions, you think about what? And if you see a word here that you agree with, write it again and it'll get bigger. If you have two words, connect them together You've got with a hyphen. So someone wrote like decision makers, factory farming. And if you like factory farming, then write to factory farming with a little hyphen and it'll get bigger. So what do I hear? Agriculture, fracking, animals, factory farming. Um, wow. Leakage, methane leaks, gas leakage, fermentation, cow burps. Um, yeah, you know, we know what to do. There's so many solutions that are out there. So how do we engage the world with all of these possibilities? Wow. <laughs> You're better at this than I even dreamed of. So many. Methane leakage, permafrost. Or we should get to the permafrost. High leverage actions. Rice, cities, gas fields, fracking, freaking fracking. <laughs> God. Oh, oil, fugitive emissions. That's from energy. This is great. Okay. Um, I'm going to just... Wow. They're moving so fast. So many. Okay. We know what to do. There are so many things. It's a question of how do we implement this in the context of the world that we are in today? And a, just a little shot and a view of that world where we're trying to change public policy. And here's We've run dozens of workshops talking about how to address climate change in high level settings. Our John Sturman, who one of the co-builders of the simulator at MIT last week was with 41 members of the US Congress showing them end roads. Here's a picture of him with it on the wall uh, and several members of Congress, Sean Caston over on the right in the blue and Teresa Leger Fernandez with the cool red earring over here. And you can see En-ROADS in the foreground. John and Michael Sonnenfeld there taking the simulation of the setting. Here's the caucus chair, Pete Aguilar. So we've done many of these sorts of sessions in Congress, but also many of you top, many of you En-ROADS climate ambassadors and others bringing it in countries around the world, big breakthroughs in Germany, in Argentina, in China, in Europe. So uh, as you engage others, maybe you see the same thing. What are we seeing? We are seeing a focus on carbon dioxide. And so traditionally, the science and the modeling and the communications have been so much stronger about energy in particular and carbon dioxide but there's such huge potential and we want to show how do we get those methane solutions that you just mentioned into the conversation. So what I want to do, particularly because half of you, more than half of you, use En-ROADS in the world. I want to show you the short version first of how we engage other people like in with top decision makers in the importance of, of methane and the many possibilities for addressing methane as its critical role of getting us below two degrees and meeting our climate goals. So here's En-ROADS. 6% of you have never seen it before. So I'll just briefly say it is this free simulator. Ava, can you send the link to it? 20 languages. And the key thing is that when you make changes in it, like, well, spoiler alert, cutting agricultural emissions, uh, or I don't know, setting carbon prices, 
it very quickly changes and shows you what is the impact of that action. Freely available, grounded in the best available science, compared against other integrated assessment models, tested against the suite of NGFS simulations that were uh, put out of integrated assessment models. All of the equations are shared in case you wanna go look at them. So here at help, model, technical reference guide, every methane equation, every parameter is here in the model. You can go and look at anything you wanna see over here in the, in the simulator itself. And many of the variables, if you don't like the assumptions, many of them you can change. Remind me later and we'll get into permafrost and clathrates uh, if we're curious about methane and biogenic emissions. Okay, that's the introduction to the basics of, of En-ROADS, but I'm back to the challenge. The challenge is the CO2, carbon dioxide, focus of so many policy centers and so many policy conversations. So watch the limit to what we can do in the energy side. And here's one way to think about it. And we encourage you, if you're gonna engage people on methane, this could be a storyline to use, is to ask them, what are all the things we can do in the clean energy revolution and to address carbon dioxide? Really quickly, set them up with that. And what they'll answer is, I'm excited about renewable energy, and we're going to encourage renewable energy, and we need better storage with big batteries, excuse me, uh, with big batteries are here, other breakthrough cost reduction in storage, hydrogen, these are things that are leading, and notice the green area in the top left is expanding. Why is it expanding? Because we're encouraging renewables and the storage of renewables. I'll do it again. See, it's growing and growing. It is this one source of our primary energy. And I'm gonna show you just the others and a little bit about the baseline. I just expanded the green area of renewables, but the others that are there that shrink as we grow renewables, coal in brown, oil in red, gas in blue, natural gas, methane gas, bioenergy there in pink, and on top of it, nuclear. If that's where we get our energy, it is part of all of the emissions of greenhouse gases. This is a really important graph, particularly when we connect carbon dioxide to methane. And I'm gonna back it up, watch this. I'll uh, gonna hit the back button here, and we're gonna go back to the, where we started before we encouraged renewable energy this shows all of the pollution that is driving warming from 2000 to 2100. Land use CO2, deforestation emissions, bioenergy emissions are here in green. There's the burning of coal, oil, and gas in brown. On top of it, we have the overall F gases, HFCs, and SF6. There's the methane in blue. We're gonna be looking at that blue area. And on top of it, is the uh, nitrous oxide. Okay, I'm going to redo the actions that we did before about encouraging renewables and storage. Watch the brown area, the black area shrink just a little bit as we implement those policies. So what happens is you talk to people about clean energy and they'll say encouraging renewables and they'll say we should have electrification, which helps a little bit more and energy efficiency. Some people will imagine some new zero carbon energy source or not. And first they say, well, all, just the clean energy revolution is not enough. Even if we get big changes, we also need to directly push on coal and oil and gas, some direct pressure on those fossil fuels. And a carbon price, boy, it helps a lot. So, and that's the energy CO2. Now look at the green area is still big of land use CO2. Cutting deforestation helps a lot. Cutting bioenergy, which is an emitter of carbon dioxide helps. All of that could get us close to two degrees, but it cannot get us where we need to be below two degrees. It's not enough. 
Uh, now note, uh, we say this has all been energy and CO2 and deforestation, but what is happening to methane in this scenario? Now, we haven't touched. Over here are the explicit directed methane features around agriculture, around waste, and leakage from energy. We haven't touched them. What is energy doing? Excuse me, what is methane doing? Methane is actually following the blue line and decreasing a good bit. So I'm gonna ask you, quick poll, uh, see if somebody knows the answer to this. Uh, why? Why are emissions, methane emissions lower? Than that? We didn't do anything about methane. Why are they lower in that scenario? What is going on? Type, this should be a quick one, reduced gas leaks. Less natural gas, less methane leakage. So it's it's less leak, less leaks because there's less gas and there's less coal and there's less oil, less use of fossil fuels. So even if we don't change the percentage of methane that is leaked from the fossil fuel industry at all, no adoption of best practices for fixing leaks. You just are fixing leaks on a smaller industry. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Good job, everybody. Uh, because the overall fossil fuel industry, uh, I think I have it here, total primary energy from fossil fuels, if it goes down that much, if we transition away, if we phase down fossil fuels, then there's less to leak. Now, mind you, the coal mines still leak even if you're not using them. So there's a concern there, but overall, less fossil fuels, less leakage. So we already have a contribution of methane in this 2.2. Without that, it would be 2.3 or 2.4. But the setup for people next is to say, okay, if that's where we sit, let's see what is possible with methane. I'm gonna give you the very simple way to engage them next, then we're gonna dig in more deeply. The simplest way to dig in is just to show the main two levers over here, agricultural emissions, waste and leakage. And Ava, can you send the link again to everybody so that they can, you can try this? Oh, actually, let me do it this way. Uh, you can go work along with me. I'm gonna hit copy scenario link. And I'm going to go into chat and I'm going to send to everyone this exact link of where it sits right now. So this is after pressure on the fossil fuel industry, after the clean energy revolution, after cutting deforestation, 2.2 degrees. Click on that link if you want to see this exact scenario. But the, what you're going to do now is show it's insufficient to get this far. We also need to take action on methane. Now, the graphs to look at are two. One is methane emissions, and then also, where are those emissions coming from? I love this graph. Look at this graph in the top right. It shows you and uh, the three big sectors. And you can see, I told you the energy production methane emissions in blue is shrinking because we have less energy production from fossil fuels. But then it also shows the wedge, that big band of agricultural methane emissions. And on top of it, Nicholas, you're in this area of waste. That is landfills, wastewater. So those are the big three areas. And what we can do next is to test. First, very briefly, but then we can dig in with much more detail, cutting agricultural emissions. It's going to be the next one. So watch. 2.2 is going to change. The yellow wedge is going to change. Uh, so I'm going to adopt best practices up to close to the maximum of what we think is possible for adopting best practices in crops and livestock, rice, addressing enteric fermentation, et cetera. So watch as we test it. So actually do a little mental... Simulation, what do you think it's going to do? 2.2 goes where? Now, mind you, we're not changing diet and food waste yet. This is just better management 
of the existing agricultural system. Here it comes. So that's another big 0.1 degree, which really matters, particularly if you're 2.2, getting down to 2.1 matters a lot. What are we doing here? This is improved animal health, rotational grazing, manure management, digesters, composting, improved rice cultivation, all of those best practices in agriculture and others. I'll show you in a minute where you can read that list and see all of the specifics. To get all that you can out of agriculture, it's very challenging, but if you click on, I did it pretty quickly, but see those three dots, click on the three dots and you're going to be supplementing best practices with the possible success of changing diets. We're headed towards 30% of food from animals. If it could get lowered down to say 22%, that is another cut. Watch the yellow area shrink even more with the adoption of diets that are different. Why do diets matter? Because we don't have, if we're not consuming as much uh, livestock and food from animals, and note, this is not hamburgers mostly. This is mostly dairy if you're thinking of cattle. It's that area. Then, of course, we don't have as much enteric fermentation, those emissions. Also, food waste, cutting food waste around the world is another thing that can cut it a little bit more. So we're closer to two degrees. The other will be waste and leakage, adopting best practices in the waste area and in cutting leakage in the entire fossil fuel extraction, delivery, burning process, all of that and mining, et cetera. So I'm gonna change that and watch this as we adopt best practices in those two areas, 1.8 below two degrees. What are we doing here? Leak detection, leak repair, upgrading valves, better new uh, electricity generation systems, methane recovery processes in waste, reduced consumption, recycling, composting, methane capture, in wastewater facilities, better wastewater facilities, methane capture in landfills. So the big story here, the big message is that CO2 energy and deforestation can get us to a certain point and to get from that, what, 2.3 or 2.4 maybe, I didn't see what it is without cutting methane from uh, fossil fuel production, down to 1.8 could be the thing that gets us to below two degrees. That's the narrative we like to tell that then gets people thinking very seriously about all of those things that you wrote about the importance of methane policy around the world and in various different sectors. So, Many of you are thinking, wait, 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 1.8, I don't want 1.8, 1.5 to stay alive. So a little side note, uh, to get there, as many of you know, it will be necessary. Well, there are other things we can do to cut methane faster. I'll show you in a minute and cut CO2 faster. However, here, uh, what's often imagined to get us from 1.8 to 1.8, five would be some of this carbon removal. And the short version of what we've done with carbon dioxide removal, you may remember previous users of En-ROADS, it used to just say afforestation here. Now we notice that people talk about nature-based approach to carbon dioxide removal and technological approaches to te carbon dioxide removal. Under here will be uh, afforestation, planting trees, but also ag soil carbon retention, and biochar live there, where over here, a uh, direct air capture and mineralization. So I'm going to undo that. And some of the things that would be necessary would be some breakthroughs that going to scale with some of these technologies, uh, which could get us, and it's necessary to remove a good bit uh, if you want to get down to 1.5, that shows almost 14 gigatons a year of many different types of carbon removal. You can see it, by the way, here in the negative emissions section. See this from 2030 down, that silver area shows carbon removal. It's below the zero line 
and you can see above it now land use CO2 is now a remover. That green area is below the zero line. The key thing back with methane is that we addressed that wedge. So that wedge, that blue wedge really shrunk. Okay, that's how you would get back to 1.5. All right, so here we were at 1.8. And what I wanna do though is shift gears a bit. There's the basic narrative. Clean energy, pressure on fossil fuels, deforestation can get us to a certain level. Methane can get us further. We need to take action here. How do we do it? So now what I'm gonna do is shift into more advanced insights and features regarding methane. But I wanna pause for just a second and see, Ellie, if you think there are any questions that have come up. And by the way, if you have questions, do use the Q&A feature in Zoom. We have a big team, including the amazing folks who built the model. Actually, this is the moment I do wanna do a little shout out to the amazing folks who built the model. It took a village. This is the whole team of the 14 who built and supported and wrote all of the descriptions to the sliders and updated the materials. This is the team and approved it all. And I wanna give a particular shout out here to two folks who really did so much rallying. Senior modeler Skook, Charles Skook Jones and Clara Iglesias who seem to want to give a special shout out to two particular contributors to this sector. But Ellie, have questions come up? Is there a question that you think I should address now before digging into production and intensity and the individual advanced features? Or should I keep going? I think probably keep going. There's a couple questions just along the way. And maybe I'll just say this, uh, Drew, you're showing your the, the graph view and somebody was asking how to see the graph view versus the list. Uh, so there's just some questions about the functionality of the tool. Yeah, yeah the some cool title. things that maybe you haven't seen the simulator in a while. Uh, old users of the simulator would see this list and you'd have to scroll down and memorize, wait, 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 what exactly? Uh, now you can, well, make, you can favorite things like Nicolas, methane intensity of waste, but that see that thumbnail view as grid in the top right corner. Our developer engineer wizard, Chris Campbell, figured out how to hit this button, and you can see all of the graphs. I'll just note they're interesting on methane. They're even more interesting on all the impacts because there's so many interesting things to explore in this view. And note they change when you implement policy like we just did. Okay, um, I'm gonna look and see if there's anything else before going into the, I guess before going into that second area, another thing to note uh, about building confidence that how did we do this? <laughs> and I wanna note that one of the ways we build confidence in a simulation like this is to start the model in 1990 with parameters and then run it for 34 years and track 32 of those years and see, did we match history for methane emissions and concentrations? And one note, I saw someone write about global warming potential. Of course, we did not use what's called a global warming potential, like translate methane emissions into as if it were carbon dioxide in order to calculate temperature and other things. We independently modeled methane and the methane cycle and how it plays out. That was really critical in the methane sector part of this. We'll also look later at how we treated permafrost emissions. As you may know, 66% of emissions of methane are humans, anthropogenic emissions. The other third is biogenic, and that's from permafrost or something called clath rates, which is suspended in, in water droplets. That's a special form of methane that gets released. And um, actually, since I just said it, in the model, of course, we had to incorporate uh, the feedbacks. So we just show you, we showed you energy emissions, waste emissions, and agricultural emissions, which increase methane concentration and increase temperature. But we also have to model, and we include it in this, 
the reinforcing positive feedback loop, sometimes called a tipping point, but really just think of it as a reinforcing feedback loop that says temperature goes up, biogenic emissions go up because of the warming of the permafrost. We'll look at those controls later, but those are the controls are in the assumptions in the bottom right. Land use affects it, but also the effect of temperature on permafrost and other assumptions. But I was telling you about the comparisons. We did a lot of work to compare history for methane emissions and also concentrations, but also we have to make sure that we're consistent with the family of integrated assessment models. And the ones that have been the most helpful have been the network for the greening of the financial system, NGFS. And they asked the people at GCAM and Message Globiome and Remind, you can see the down in the legend, to uh, share their current policy projections. And you can see that there are three different lines, a little higher, a little medium, a little lower. We're a little bit on the higher end, but in the family of those models. Concentration, therefore, is a little bit higher as we compare against them. So we do a good bit of comparisons here, but also we look at the reduction comparisons. So these other models have a below two degrees scenario. And so we work to replicate the assumptions that they put into their model as closely as we can and see how did we do. So you see the blue line is our simulation of methane emissions and the others for uh, their scenario where we fall a little steeper they're a little more steady with their falling. This is one of the ways that we test the model. We also like to test and look at possibilities for meeting the global methane pledge. There's 250 megatons a year in 2030. We'll look at that number later. Can we meet that goal in the simulation? Okay, so that's just a little bit about the confidence building test that Skook and, and others did. But let's now look at what is a little bit underneath both the advanced view here in these sliders, but also uh, the uh, some distinctions about how we actually modeled it. I think it's really cool. Check this out. We were talking about energy before. The way we think about energy, we can now go and look at methane emissions from energy by source, stacked, coal, oil, gas, Bioenergy, I didn't realize, is a source because incomplete combustion of trees and pellets leads to methane emissions. The rest of this is, is leakage from coal, oil, and gas. And we showed you before how the clean energy revolution and pressure on fossil fuels will cut those methane emissions from the energy industry on its own. But I want to make a distinction between the two ways to cut energy methane emissions. Go here to primary energy type, primary energy demand totals. And this is total primary energy from fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. Over here is a new graph, the methane intensity here, it's going to be under here, under that same area. This is methane intensity of primary energy. I'm actually seeing this number out some in the world. How much methane is emitted per unit of primary energy? Kilotons of methane per exajoule. This distinction is very important if you want to get serious about using En-ROADS on methane. Production, how much we're doing in the world and then the methane intensity, the emissions per unit of that production. And you're gonna see it again, agricultural production, emissions per unit of crops and livestock, waste production, and emissions per unit of waste. We can do two things. We can have less stuff that we're producing like coal, oil, and gas, or we can make sure that we emit as little as possible for every unit of energy. So notice the difference here. Over here with waste and leakage, I'm gonna click on the three dots and we're going to use detailed settings. And now you're not lumping them all together. 
getting very precise about methane leakage from energy symptom systems. This is from, and you go here and read about it, Clara and Ellie and team and Janet wrote all these things, extraction, processing, and distribution. This is adoption of best practices, pipeline maintenance, et cetera, methane recovery from coal mines, flooding abandoned mines to reduce the emissions, all those things. By the way, click on the I button and you will see what we just wrote and released this morning about many of those details of what can be done here. And there's a lot more information for you to understand the dynamics, co-benefits, equity considerations, et cetera, all over here, all the links of where we got some of the, these, and importantly, the explainer. So if you want a summary of all that I'm saying here, and, and Ava, can you share this with everybody? Go to the explainer and you can read through I'll open it here. It really has so much as a video, an 11 minute version of all this, and an explanation of everything that we're looking at in the simulator and et cetera. Okay, I'm gonna go back over here to methane by source. So methane leakage from energy systems, what percent of the total potential reduction? 93% cuts the methane intensity of energy, primary energy, following the blue line. That's one thing we can do. The other is just to have less energy from fossil fuels. So two approaches, they interact a little bit some, but these are the two big approaches that you can take and see what is the impact from the energy sector. Now I'm gonna switch over and do the same from the agricultural sector. That lives under land, forest, and food. And here, total agricultural production. And note we modeled separately crops and livestock. We want the methane intensity of agriculture, not energy. Lives, land, forestry, and food. Methane intensity of agriculture. So in the same way, there are two big things we can do. We can change the methane intensity of agriculture. If you go under here, we have broken out levers because they're very different what you'd be doing. Methane and nitrous oxide, those the, the best practices in this area for livestock affect both nitrous oxide and methane. So we group them. Here are the things that you're doing. Improved manure management, uh, enhance animal health, feed additives, lower emission breeds, et cetera. So we could imagine actions there, less emissions per cow, goat, sheep, et cetera, livestock. The second is actions within the crop area. These are very different. Alter alternate wetting and drying and rice cultivation, optimizing fertilizer application, use of cover crops, reduced tilling, all of these actions. And by the way, we share our references. You wanna see where we got these numbers? Go read this paper, this report. It will explain to you much of where we got the data. So with that, if we imagine a 88% reduction, then we can see methane intensity of agriculture. Look in the bottom right for the yellow area. See that yellow band gets thinner and thinner as we cut emissions. The second way is to reduce total agriculture production. Many of you wrote this before in the suggestions in the poll. What can be done there? The two things that we have, food from animals and food waste, as I showed you earlier. So less food from animals and or less emissions from food from animals and from agriculture, two approaches. There's a similar approach, Nicolas, in the area where you are focused around waste. And I'll undo this. We can show over here the methane intensity of overall waste. Right now, we're seeing it as and assuming it to be flat over time, but here we can adopt best practices in 
methane and nitrous oxide from waste. And we can go read, what are we doing? This is about landfills and wastewater. Best practices from waste management and decreasing total waste, reducing consumption, recycling, and composting. Those are things that reduce the volume of waste produced. So recycling's in the model. This is recycling, composting, and reducing consumption. Gas capture programs as well. We do them, boom. We can see, look at how much we can reduce that brown area. Now put it together, methane leakage from energy systems um, and also, but also, if we did it, not over 30 years, when we modeled it, we assumed it takes time to diffuse these practices in the world. It also, when there's capital involved, infrastructure like energy, upgrading infrastructure to be less, to have less leaks, we do model the retrofitting, but we also model that it takes time for new, less leaky infrastructure to get uh, built and then to retire away the old stuff. So we have that capital stock turnover, which makes things play out more slowly than we'd love. Regarding this, these practices, what if they dropped in 13 years, not 30? That would mean those, those methane intensity falls faster. In the same way over with agricultural emissions, what, and I'm going to, uh, reduce methane and nitrous oxide from livestock and from crops. And we're going to do it faster, hopefully over these 13 years. Mind you, bad news if we have to wait, if they don't start until 2025, 2052, we want them to start in later this year, but you can change what year that happens. So you show the cost of delay on methane as well. But if we did all of these things, we looked at overall, I think actually I need to reduce food from animals and food waste. Let's go look and see how we are relative to the global methane pledge. And our technical team realized that we would get to, by 2030, 250-ish, Right in here, 250 megatons CO2 CH4 a year, which is the global methane pledge. So you just saw the recreation of all the actions that would be necessary to deliver upon the global methane pledge. And I'm gonna go back, 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 unimplement them, and then little by little in energy, in leakage, in waste, in uh, agricultural production, food waste, diet, best practices in agriculture. This is what's needed to meet the global methane pledge. Okay, putting it together, that's a scenario that gets us to make a huge contribution in just methane. Now, to do more from here, of course, you've got to have less energy production, coal, oil, gas, et cetera, less bioenergy. And these are the things that get us down to 2.1 and then again, deforestation could be something that would get us close to two degrees. I'm gonna check my notes and see other things that I really wanted to make sure to point you towards. Oh, I said I was gonna talk about uh, biogenic emissions, natural emissions. And that is most viewable when we model actual methane concentration. You know, we talk about parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, 350 parts per million, 450. Well, there's an equivalent with methane and we explicitly modeled it, parts per million. There it is, there it is dropping. Now, one of the important assumptions in the model will affect it and it has to do with the land, carbon and methane cycles. So this is the second source of methane, not human caused anthropogenic but biogenic, driven by that feedback loop I showed you, the positive feedback loop, temperature goes up. So that's melting permafrost, that's releasing. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's allowing the organic material there to undergo the anaerobic digestion via bacteria that produces methane, particularly around the Arctic, 
in the northern part of the Earth. And we don't exactly know how much more gets emitted when we have melting of permafrost. So we let you change some of those numbers. So we had to set a temperature threshold and we found that was consistent with this study, but watch the concentration. Do you see it wiggling a little bit? If that assumption is higher or lower, it's a little different. Those are, and you can go and explore those effects here in that part of the simulator. Also, just want to just make sure it's clear that for other uses outside of methane, if we're just really looking at overall temperature, I'll go back here. We have these other levers, particularly here in waste and leakage, in nitrous oxide from industry. I'll pull up those emissions. N2O in fertilizer, a very important greenhouse gas. Those emissions falling a lot, they could fall even more. F gases, fluorinated gases, we're gonna be doing more on this soon. Those could fall, they're important as well. Look how that makes the difference. SF6, PFC, HFCs between 2.0 and 1.9, getting us a little bit lower on our emissions. Okay, I wanna point us also to an interesting measure regarding methane I've never seen. And if there are methane experts out there, please let us know if you've seen this, because we calculated two things that we've never seen before, the overall methane per capita and methane intensity of the global economy. I've seen the methane intensity of the energy sector, but we see how many tons of methane per million dollars GDP. It has been falling. We have blips when GDP went didn't grow as fast during this global recession, during the pandemic. But with the policies we see, we can see that overall methane intensity dropping. I've never seen anyone calculating the global methane intensity, but there it is. Uh, interested to see if that is helpful. Uh, I'm going to go and now start pulling it together towards what this means. And let me pull over to another poll that I really want to engage you on. Okay, here it is. Please go to poll everywhere. You've just seen there are so many things we can do and they are necessary. Without them, we don't get well below two degrees. How do we address them? Overall production of waste, overall production of energy, overall production in agriculture, and or how much we emit per unit. Put it all together, we can meet the global methane pledge and we can contribute to limiting warming to well below two degrees. This is a tool for you to use out there in the world to engage top decision makers and everybody into taking action. And I hope that when you went through this, you felt more inspired to do something about it. So the methane solution that you'd love to contribute to is waste, plug leaks, dairy, natural gas, uh, cow burps, extraction, composting, consumption, veganism, diet, plant diet, burps, composting, reduced leaks. Fantastic. This is what is needed out there in the world. This is what's needed out in the world to take action. Waste, waste water, leakage, excuse me, landfills, all that can be done to capture methane in landfills, but also to reduce how much, and the problem is organic material that goes to these landfills and uh, goes through anaerobic digestion via bacteria that is without oxygen stuck under a landfill. We have to keep that organic material out of landfills. That's how we address waste. Less food waste is a powerful way to do it. Look at all of these amazing actions. Fantastic. Okay, so some other offers for you. You see these tools 
that we are offering. There's a framework that I want to give you as you think about it and pull it together. I got you this far, remember? Biogenic emissions on the right, three main areas of emissions. Well, I then laid out to you two ways to affect each of them, the scale of fossil fuel production or the intensity, scale of waste intensity, scale of ag intensity. And the policies you just saw, all of the best practices for coal, oil, gas, renewables, carbon pricing that I showed you first, right? Less fossil fuels or adoption of best practices for leak detection, repair, et cetera. Oh, and in the model, oh, I didn't show you this. We made it, I hope there's some energy leakage heroes out there. Did I show you before? I'll just, I'm gonna actually do this, just this one. Well, I'm gonna open a new one. I'm gonna open a new version of the simulator just to show you this. You can change assumptions in the model. So, waste and leakage. And over here is going to be the methane intensity of primary energy. If we are reducing methane leakage from energy systems, how do we energy how do we know what that potential maximum is? I'm going to move it to 100. That 100 or 100 100 is based on studies or the number pulled out of the IEA Global Methane Tracker Report, okay? That's where this figure comes from. But what we did is we made this number changeable here under methane leakage. So if you think that they're exaggerating and that kind of cut to leakage of a full 60% maximum abatement for new energy production capacity is too much. Then you say, you know what? I don't think that's possible. Can't count on it. It's only possible to get to 40. If you think it's 80, move it up here. You can change that assumption. Wanted to make sure you see that that was made transparent so you can change that assumption in the model. All right, back over here to our offer to you in the last few minutes. Our offer to you is if you want to engage top decision makers in taking action on methane, there are several forms of doing this. There is a climate solutions workshop, an interactive exercise, online, virtual, climate action simulation, a two to three hour role play. I'm flying tomorrow to Las Vegas to the Climate Preparedness Conference to run our game with Catherine Markova from our team, or a customized one to two day experience. Folks, I thought, Andrew, you might be on this call, have run, have hosted these workshops, and they've found them helpful. Send us an email if you would like us to engage parliamentarians, decision makers, business people to see the big picture on climate and then zero in on what can be done in the waste sector. What can be done? Overall, well, we only have, see if there's any other, you know, I think that's about it. Okay, what a journey today. With the help of a global methane hub, we were able to improve methane in the model. We changed the front screen. That's a big change to many folks. Go to the explainer and watch the video for tips about how to engage people with this new interface or go to the blog post that we just did. But the news from the methane modeling world is good. There's so much that we can do in the waste, ag and energy sectors in order to get those emissions down. It's not enough to have the clean energy revolution. It's not enough to push on fossil fuels. We need breakthroughs faster than people think are coming in the methane areas and in nitrous oxide and F gases to get us to well below two degrees. We have these tools for you to use in 20 languages. There's a full course you can take to learn how to engage your top decision makers. Ava, post that link again, if you would, of mastering En-ROADS. We're gonna stick around at the top of the hour to answer more of your questions. 
But for now, look around you. The world needs breakthroughs on climate. Top decision makers are being flooded with possibilities that are not this. Have you seen all that's being talked about, frankly, lower leverage actions in carbon capture and storage, in some measures around carbon removal that may not help for 20 or 30 years, or research and development into a new energy source that might help us in 20 or 30 years, or worse yet, natural gas as a destination. There is distracting information that's out there. Top decision makers need access to the tools that will help them distinguish between high leverage and low leverage actions. They need experienced facilitators and professionals who can engage them. They need the insights laid out clearly. That's why Climate Interactive is here. That's why you're here, because you as a team member using these tools, reaching around the world to find ways to support Climate Interactive to continue to improve these models. We are a community together committed to greenhouse gas emissions falling rapidly. And if we don't get there, it's not because we didn't give our all. That's what we're all about. Go use these tools, make a diff big difference. Go get them, everybody.